Okay. Okay, so this talk is going to be quite different. <laughs> We're, um, so we'll be talking about the, the work that's in the exhibition that's all around you. And um, so we're talking about the idea about architectural and national identity as we see it through the Centennial Projects, which were this um, set of building projects and other projects uh, funded in large part by the, or in part by the federal government in the lead up to the 1967 Centennial of Canada. And I got interested in this, first of all, when I came across in, uh, in, an old, in old copies of the uh, REIC journal, the REIC is the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada, uh, these two images. So on the left is an image from the REIC's annual meeting, annual general meeting from uh, 1960. And this gentleman was speaking, Stephen Baker. So amazing to me, the idea that we would have the Prime Minister of Canada speaking at the REIC convention. And then I came across the one on the right, which is four years later. And you may notice this gentleman, who was the honorary speaker four years later at the REIC annual convention. And that, of course, is Pearson. It, and again, it would be absolutely unheard of for that's a sitting prime minister to speak at the REIC today, just unheard of. So this, this really struck something with me. And then I started to look at what they actually said because the transcripts of their speeches were available. And um, they, they both talked about various things, but they, they talked mostly about the relationship of architecture to, um, to government and architecture to uh, national identity. And then uh, Diefenbaker in particular made this amazing statement where he, this was 1960, and so he's saying in a few short years this nation will be celebrating its centennial. So he's already talking about 1967. And then what's bolded in there, he's, he said the committee will be asking architects to find, to suggest something to touch the hearts of Canadians, something to represent the unity of our country, something to embody the paradox of two great national stocks which join together to make confederation possible. So he's being very clear that national unity and a national identity is going to be the subject matter for this architecture right from the beginning. We're were we going to switch at this point, or do you want to keep going? Okay. Uh, Pearson uh, kind of echoed these things, although Pearson, you know, Pearson was more of an intellectual than Diefenbaker. Uh, so Pearson, in his speech, he quotes Montesquieu, and he talks about the relationship between national character and ge geography and climate. And he goes on to say, and again, this is what's in bold, for today, as our population moves more and more to urban centers, it's buildings which make our geography. And then, today, as the Italian critic Bruno Zevi puts it, architecture is environment, the stage on which our lives unfold. So we'll see that those statements come out very clearly in some of the buildings, but this idea that um, that, that uh, the importance of landscape and the, the kind of critical issue that landscape, that buildings play in the 20th century of becoming our landscapes, becoming our, our kind of total environments. And then he goes on to make a clear announcement, which is about the money. So he tells us, he tells the, the group sitting there, and you can imagine how excited all of these architects must have been to hear him say, that it's estimated, in relation to the preparations for the centennial, it's estimated that $250 million of public funds will be made available for this commemoration. And in very rough numbers, that's probably the equivalent of about $2 billion today. Eight to one is a kind of reasonable. So that's a pretty big announcement. So just to set a bit of context for 
um, these announcements, um, a lot of what was happening in Canada through the 1950s and 60s leading up to the centennial celebration um, was in response to the Massey Report. So the Massey Report, um, uh, led by Vincent Massey, um, the, uh, who, who led the um, commission or the commission on the national development in the arts, letters, and sciences, sciences in Canada, convened in 1949, uh, published in 1951. So the commission was brought together in the years immediately following World War II, out of concerns that um, Canada, which was going through the transition of moving away from its historical colonial identity, um, uh, needed to establish its own new national identity, and there was a, a, a tremendous concern that they were that ca Canadian culture was going to be overtaken and um, essentially swamped by American culture. So if we were losing our cultural, primarily British but Franco-British identity, uh, to become uh, our own nation, then how could we do that without essentially being taken over by American culture, which was already, of course, extremely dominant through Hollywood, etc. Um, so the commission developed a number of um, recommendations, and some of the some of the institutions that we are familiar with today really are products of the commission of the of the Massey Report. So the um, Canada Council for the Arts. Um, was founded in 1957 under a slightly different name, Canada Council in 1958, uh, really came directly out of the Massey Report, um, as did extensive funding for higher education and other cultural initiatives. And one of the um, recommendations that came out of the Massey Report was that in the area of architecture, which was really a very small part of this report, it's 400 odd pages of the report, I think six were devoted to architecture and town planning. Um, but one of the things that came out of this was the need for cultural infrastructure to support the development of the arts, letters, and science, sciences in Canada. So there's also a, a building program implied by the Massey Report in the area of cultural facilities, so theaters, museums, uh, educational buildings, and so on and so forth. So this is, this is part of the context of the 1950s, out of which Diefenbaker and Pearson's announcements are being made. So through the 1950s and into the 60s, we see a number of very important uh, performing arts and other cultural centers being built across the country, which become the kind of uh, precedent for what's going to happen in, in the 60s as part of the centennial. So certainly the Stratford uh, Festival Theatre, Stratford, Ontario from 1957 is an important um, example of this. Uh, the O'Keeffe Centre, since renamed the Sony Centre in Toronto, by Page and Steele with Peter Dickinson and Earl C. Morgan. So again, these sort of very exuberant modern buildings that are now being seen as the kind of um, uh, expression of a, an emerging Canadian culture and cultural activity. And then uh, finally, the Queen Elizabeth Theatre in Vancouver um, and Place des Arts in Montreal, both the results of competitions, uh, which was something else that the Massey uh, Report strongly recommended, um, and both by and the Montreal firm of Affleck, Debora, Dimacopoulos, Levensold, and Size, also known as Architects in Cooperative uh, Partnership, shortened to ARCOP. So these, this particular firm would become a very important contributor to um, the subsequent centennial projects. Meanwhile, uh, although the um, Centennial Commission wasn't actually formed until 1961, there were people across Canada who were working uh, from the late 1950s on what kind of what kind of celebration could we have for the centennial? And the, the, the key one, or the most notable of them all, was the work that was being done by Frank McKinnon and, and others in Charlottetown. Uh, Charlottetown, if you remember your Canadian history, was the site of the, the first uh, conference, the first Confederation conference that took place in 1864, where all the politicians from the rest of Canada came to Charlottetown. Uh, uh, the story is that they had a boat full of champagne with them. <laughs> and with lots of champagne, and it was supposed to be uh, a conference about a, a trade agreement. And by the end of the conference, it had been the, the bones of a discussion about how Canada would be formed. So kind of amazing thing. But uh, so Frank McKinnon and his group decided that they wanted to celebrate the 1864 conference leading up to uh, 1964 for the centennial of that. So they uh, had a piece of land, which was a, a market that was kind of ready to be demolished, I guess, and they demolished it, uh, that was sitting right beside the um, 
what was it called? Um, it's a provincial building. Provincial province, yeah. province house. Is it? Okay, province so, house. Which is the location of the original conference. So they um, um, <coughs> decided to run a competition for the design of a, a cultural center, and they decided to ask the federal government for funding for it. Uh, on the grounds that this is actually a national project, a national issue, not really something about Charlottetown. Um, and so in the end, the federal government agreed and uh, donated two and a half million dollars, which at that time was quite a lot of money. Um, so here we have, uh, uh, again, Diefenbaker with uh, Dimitri Dimakopoulos from Arcop the winners of the competition at the um, event in Ottawa at which the competition and results were announced. The competition uh, was, was quite interesting. There were some 40 entries, 42 is the number that I had, uh, and some of them were quite interesting. Some, uh, like the one on the left by uh, Blaine Lemoyne and Edwards, were, were kind of very high modern. This almost looks like Mies. The one on the right by Gordon Shaney is obviously much more expressive in terms of the verticality on the site. Uh, and uh, you know, maybe my favorite is this one by an early Raymond Moriana who got an, an honorable mention for this incredibly um, monumental piece on, on, for the project. The project that won, is this one, this is the model, and you can see a model of the project at the, the other end of the gallery. I believe it's a different model, I don't think it's this one. Um, but you can see in the, in the foreground is uh, Province House, up here, maybe I can use this. Okay, uh, it's okay, I'll just use the... Put a ringtone. <laughs> So, Province House out here, and then clustered over here we have uh, an art gallery, uh, a large theater that is now known for Anne of Green Gables nonstop, and a library focused around a, an empty courtyard. Empty, uh, in the sense that there's no, there, there is a building there, but it has no particular program, and that's except to be the memorial space. And here you can see, uh, a, a view uh, looking at the, the Memorial Hall in the center and the relationship between Memorial Hall and Province House. This, this you know, quite clearly framed. That view is no longer there because of uh, subsequent renovations that have been done. Or it's at least not as clearly it's, it's there. As clear. yeah. So, um, as a result of this, uh, mostly as a result of the two and a half million dollars that the federal government agreed to give this, uh, well, the story as told by Peter Ackroyd, at least, who uh, was one of the um, uh, administrators of the project within the federal government, uh, when Quebec understood that Charlottetown was getting two and a half million dollars, Quebec said, we want our two and a half million dollars as well because Quebec City was the site of the second conference. And that was agreed to, at which point all the other provinces said, we want our two and a half million dollars as well. And since there was money to be spent and a, and a celebration to be made, the federal government agreed. So in the end, they launched the Confederation Memorial Program, which gave a grant of two and a half million dollars to each province that had to be matched by an equivalent, at least an equivalent amount of money from, from the province uh, to develop a single building project of a lasting nature that would commemorate the uh, centennial, co commemorate uh, Confederation. And it was to be a project of either um, recreation or arts in nature. That was the, that was the requirement. So we'll just go very quickly through the projects from east to west. The one you see here is also by ARCOP, uh, the Arts and Culture Center in St. John's. And you can see kind of some similarities formally to, the, to what we were just looking at. Um, the Sir Charles Tucker Medical Building, 
at Dalhousie, not strictly arts and culture or recreation, but they, this, is, this was Nova Scotia's, uh, and even less strictly arts and culture, the Provincial Administration Building in Fredericton, which you can see uh, rendering up on the wall here as well. And then out on the prairies, well, sorry, we're not to the prairies yet, but you'll see why I said that in a minute. Uh, <laughs> in Quebec, uh, the Grand Théâtre de Québec by um, Victor Proust. Ontario was the, the Ontario Science Centre by a 27-year-old Ray, Ray Moriana when he got the commission. Uh, in Winnipeg, Centennial Conference, Centennial uh, Concert Hall by uh, Green Blankenstein Russell with Moody, Moody Moore and Partners and Smith Carter, so large conglomerate. Uh, in, in Saskatchewan, they broke the mold by doing two projects, one in Saskatoon and one in Regina, and they were essentially both concert halls, and I always get it mixed up which one is which, but luckily I've got labels here. So this is Saskatoon Centennial Auditorium on the top by Kirk Collingworth Riches, and on the bottom, the Sask Saskatchewan Center for the Arts. Um, by uh, Izumi Arnott and Sugiyama. Uh, Alberta, Alberta's project uh, is in Edmonton, not Calgary, and it's the uh, Provincial Museum and Archives, um, designed by the Department of Public Works. Um, we, in this case, we have the name of the designer, Finn Nielsen, uh, but he was not an independent architect, but was working for the Department of Public Works. This building, I think, is... It's, they're moving out into a new facility, so its future is uncertain. And in British Columbia, we have the Museum and Archives and Curatorial Block in Victoria. And in this case, it was again designed by the Department of Public Works, and we do not know the name of, of the individual. It didn't appear in any of the documentation. Yeah. Uh, and then we have the territories. And in, uh, on the top, you can see the Civic Building and Fire Hall in Whitehorse, and on the bottom is the Hay River Library in Hay River Northwest Territories, which um, I believe was built without the skylights that give it yeah. its little bit of expressive content. So it, in addition to the uh, Confederation Memorial Program that led to the large, uh, significant projects in each of the provincial capitals, there was the Centennial Grants Program as well, which was um, made available to municipalities. And the funding for those projects was done on the basis of um, uh, sort of per capita, um, uh, based on population numbers. Um, what would happen was uh, uh, municipalities would, would uh, uh, propose projects to the federal government. Uh, if the project was accepted, the federal government would provide one third of the funding. One third would have to be uh, uh, generated by the province, and the other one third was the responsibility of the municipality, either through municipal funds or through fundraising. Uh, there was a there was actually a cap of federal government uh, money. The maximum was uh, one dollar per, per, per population. Yeah. So so it was a it was very clearly defined. It it resulted in a great many projects, over two thousand of uh, which about 900, just under 900, were some kind of building project. Now that could be anything from a planetarium like Calgary's, which was one of these projects, um, or it could be a, a cenotaph in a park, it could be a set of bleachers and a baseball diamond. So it, it, the range was extraordinary. Um, so in our exhibition, we only represent a small number of these that were buildings that had some kind of extraordinary quality. But the numbers are very important because you, what you realize is that with you know, roughly 900 of these projects across the country, virtually every community in Canada was somehow touched by one of these projects, even if it's a very modest one. And in many cases, it might be in addition to a community center, very kind of modest in terms of architecture and, and expenditure, but very significant to the communities in which they reside. And many of them, of course, still bear the identity of Centennial Hall or whatever the, the, the project might have been. And, and just to, just for a moment, um, kind of hammer at home the effect of, of this program on, on Canada, some of these numbers are incredible. 428 community centers as a result of this project. So imagine 428 community centers across the province, across the, the country. Uh, what do we have? 137 libraries. 67 museums and art galleries. One UFO landing pad. 
when you have flown that down. But that, that's it's quite a quite an amazing infrastructure. So some of the more remarkable examples of these were some of the important um, municipal projects that were proposed by various cities across the country. Um, quite often they would have multiple proposals. They might get funding for more than one. In some cases they would they would focus on a single significant project. Um, so this is a, this is the project for Vancouver, which was the um, planetarium and museum. So in addition to the Ontario Science Centre, which was one of the um, Confederation grant projects, uh, there were other sort of space and science related projects. Of course, the Vancouver Planetarium and Museum with its um, uh, sort of uh, hybrid flying saucer and Haida um, First Nations hat sort of um, um, uh, theater structure. Uh, of course, the planetarium here in uh, Calgary, which we'll talk about a bit more later on. Um, this is a library um, in Edmonton, which is now known as the Milner Library, right in the middle of downtown Edmonton. Um, significantly transformed. This is one of the buildings that has been very significantly and not very sympathetically transformed over the years. Um, this is just an example of some of, some of the, the buildings that were being done in smaller communities. This is Oakville, Ontario, which is uh, 30 kilometers west of Toronto, um, and it also built a uh, essentially a multi-function cultural and recreational center, um, and this also starts to capture some of the uh, the, the flavor of the the aesthetic of these buildings. This is a fairly common approach to the to the uh, articulation of the centennial projects that we'll see also in this show. Um, the use extensive use of concrete. Um, uh, playing with themes of brutalism, which is something we'll talk about a bit more as we go forward. And then in, in addition to these two projects, so the, the the provincial ones that we've talked about and the community ones, there were two projects that were deemed to be of national significance, and those are uh, on the screen behind me. Uh, again, the Charlottetown uh, Confederation Center for the Arts on the left, which was deemed to be national. Oh, and by the way, I should say we're, we're using um, in pretty much all instances, the, the images that were published at the time of the construction of the building. So, and the reason we do that is that we, we think it's likely that the architects had some hand in, in the selection of these images. They may have taken the images themselves. So I, I, I'm always fascinated with this particular image, of, which has the one girl, one young girl, playing in the mud puddle outside this building that has been, you know, almost, carefully designed to look as desolate as possible. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, we have the, uh, the other national project, which is the National Arts Center in Ottawa. And these two make an interesting pair as well because they are the same architectural firm. They're both Barcop. They have uh, other similarities that we'll get into a little bit more. So the exhibition um, documents uh, 21 of these projects. So just a small sampling but uh, projects that we feel are the most exemplary and sort of represent, representative of this movement. And you can see that even in the, the small sampling that we have, they're, they're spread in, you know, very sort of clearly entirely across the country. Um, and uh, this map is reproduced in the show and it lists each of the projects that are included here. Um, also, of course, a very, very important event of 1967, which resulted in a tremendous amount of architectural experimentation was Expo in Montreal. That was funded under a completely different program. So in, in our exhibition, we don't delve into it in detail because we're talking about the centennial pro programs um, exclusive of Expo. Expo was a project unto itself, which was, I think, the single biggest expenditure of all the, of all the centennial projects for, I mean, not surprisingly, given the scope of the, of the project. Um, and it, it was a very significant uh, project in terms of some of the themes that we're looking at in this exhibition as well, most significantly the idea uh, that the projects were about building the new. Even though the centennial program was a commemorative event of a, of a, of a centenary, uh, the architecture that resulted from it was in no way nostalgic or, um, or historicist in any way. It was very much about looking to the future. Expo was a very clear representation of that, but so are most of the projects we're talking about in the exhibition. Oops, sorry. Sorry, we, we both have uh, trigger fingers here. Um, in addition to the buildings and in addition, in addition to Expo, there were a couple of other really interesting uh, projects that came out of the commission. One of those was the Centennial Train, 
uh, which um, anybody in the room see the centennial train? <laughs> So the centennial train. Yeah, horn did open up. Yes, it did. That's uh, right. Yeah. The first four notes. <laughs> uh, so the, the centennial train, of course, was loaded with uh, various exhibitions and, and traveled literally across the country. And it would stop in your town, and you would go, and everybody in the whole town would be there. <laughs> Just kind of amazing thing. Uh, and uh, and probably the the most kind of lasting thing in a way is the graphic design, and particularly the, the famous maple leaf, which uh, if you look around the show, you'll see various versions of it. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, monochrome, sometimes in multi multiple colors, sometimes outlines, sometimes not. And, but the most interesting thing of all about this is what it says here. There's no copyright. It was designed to be used People were allowed to use it in whatever form they wanted, and that's why, why you know, at the time of the centennial, it was everywhere. And even today, I'm sure in Calgary, I know in Toronto, in my neighborhood, if I walk down the street, there are places where the sidewalk has the centennial symbol embedded in it because that piece of sidewalk was poured in 1967. I wish we had an image of the sesquicentennial. Mm. Logo, quite different. <laughs> uh, and and again, you know, this this uh, graphic design is very clearly not about looking to a past, but looking to looking to you know a, a modern future for Canada. And th this is just uh, a few examples of the, some of the logos that came out of the Centennial uh, buildings. Uh, again, on the on the left we have the maple leaf. In the center, we have a quite brilliant one, uh, the Ontario Science Center, and they're still using this logo. Which uh, the so the trillium, the white trillium, is Ontario's flower. So making the, the three circles that become the trillium is kind of brilliant, I think. And then on the, on the right uh, is the original logo for the National Arts Center. They've now changed it within the last few years. Uh, this one is interesting to me because it's essentially a stylized plan of the building. As, as is the Ontario Science Center. As is the Ontario um, Science Center for that. So one of the re one of the reasons that it's we think it's important to look at the graphic design is that in fact it represents a certain sensibility that shows up in the architecture as well, which is playing with um, un un unorthodox geometries. So what we'll see with many of the buildings, although some some adopt a very sort of conventional rectilinear architectural vocabulary, many of them don't. Many of them are working with geometries that are quite um, distinct from. Uh, um, what we're used to seeing in terms of the orthogonal grids of, of our cities, and they are they are presented often in opposition to those um, to those grids. Right. Okay, so uh, in in analyzing and thinking about these works, uh, we came across three fairly loose themes that we think uh, gives us a way of, of thinking through this program. And the first one we've already touched on a couple of times is this idea of building the new. Uh, and the idea that, that the projects were, that, were, that resulted, uh, almost without exception, were not historical in nature. They weren't about looking to Canada's past, but were really thinking about what's, what's going to come next. And, you know, I just love this image <laughs> uh, of um, the uh, Centennial Concert Hall in, in Winnipeg. And again, this is an image from the time, right? uh, because it, it kind of, um, tells us about that, that uh, energy of newness and vibrancy that, that was being projected. And I mean, interesting in the context of what just came out recently in the news about the, uh, the most recent census figures that show that our population is aging very significantly. So for the first time in our history, we have more people over 65 than we have people under 14. Um, in 1967, half of the Canadian population was 25 or younger. And so there's a, there's a kind of youthful exuberance that shows up in a lot of the representations of the time as well. And this is the Milner Library in Edmonton. Um, you know, we, we show, well, you can see it there on, on the wall, we showed the exterior view earlier, but what really struck me about this, and, and this no longer exists as an interior, right? But what really struck me when I got these images from, from the Milner Library was just how incredibly modern it was at the time. 
this uh, sketch of the, um, the, the restaurant or food hall, cafe, whatever you would call it, at the Ontario Science Centre, that's you know, literally about the idea of space and about, and you can just feel the kind of, again, the modern exuberance about it. And if you look at the chairs, you can see that they're, you know, they're formed plastic chairs. Nobody's, at this moment, thinking about the past. Right? And of course, we can say the same very clearly about the Calgary Planetarium uh, in several ways. First of all, uh, programmatically, we can say that the planetarium by its very nature, is thinking is not thinking about commemorating the past of our life on Earth, but thinking about what the future has to hold in the broader universe. Uh, and so, you know, even in this drawing, you see here the rocket ship, right? Just quite kind of incredible. Uh, and and then there's there's ideas, formal ideas, and, and material ideas that are very clearly about looking forward and about thinking about new ideas. I mean, this is a, the, the dome, at, at least at this moment, was a kind of um, version of a geodesic dome, right? Not quite the way it got built, but. Um, but, you know, the, I think the most striking example of this idea about the new is also a space-related project. Um, and this one is, also in Alberta, it's from St. Paul, Alberta, and it is the world's first flying saucer landing pad. <laughs> Federally funded. Federally funded, <laughs> yes. This was a successful project, a successful application. Yeah. Um, for the opening day, apparently, uh, Paul Hellyer, who at that time was Minister of, of Defense, arranged for a flyover by some Air Force jets. Um, so they took it very seriously, yeah. even though it was obviously not so serious. Yeah, uh, but and, but you can see that you can see that the intention of of building the new not only in the program but also in the form and also in the way it's being represented. Right. This is not a kind of state architectural drawing. This is this is a an image that's trying to tell us something really exciting. Some kind of supernova going on. Yeah. In the background. And you know, if we look at images from opening day, we can clearly see that the. The, uh, <laughs> the attendees thought so too, and the the first uh, I guess the first uh, uh, UFO uh, passengers to visit the landing pad are in the photo on the right. And then if we look a little bit further east, um, you know, in the theme of building the new, we could talk about almost any of the projects. Um, but uh, we put, put up this image because this is from opening night at the National Arts Centre, where the opening night was, uh, there were a couple of pieces on the, on the program, but the key one was, was this ballet that had been commissioned for the opening night of the National Arts Centre, Cranarch, um, by Sinakis, by Yanis Sinakis, commissioned by, from Yanis Sinakis, with sets by Victor Vazarelli. Now, could you imagine Canada today <laughs> commissioning work like that for our national stage from the equivalent artists today? It's, it's kind of beyond me how we managed to do that in 1967. So, <clears throat> excuse me, a second theme, a second theme that emerged from our analysis of the work was <coughs> this idea of brutalism, which I mentioned earlier and its relationship to landscape in particular. Um, so, brutalism um, was a uh, movement in architecture that um, had started um, in the UK and in France in the 1950s um, and had been defined in various ways by different critics. Um, but in, in essentially the way we come to understand brutalism is through a couple of different lenses. One is through its um, very um, sort of idiosyncratic and very kind of anti-historicist formal approach, also very anti-hierarchical in the sense that it, it typically adopts uh, organizational strategies that are very different from conventional building, especially if you look at 
uh, cultural institutions and cultural monuments that we're familiar with, which traditionally often have taken on the form of neoclassical fronts, temple fronts with a very clear axial entrance and so forth. A lot of the buildings that would be described as brutalist resist or even um, subvert this idea. And one of, the, one of the analyses of this attitude comes out of the, the uh, Britain of the 1950s, where brutalism was described by some critics as the architecture, an architecture that was developed to, to represent the values of the welfare state. So it's anti-historical, anti-hierarchical, um, and, and intended also to represent a kind of accessibility to everybody, as opposed to an elitist architecture. So in this sense, it not only subverts the historical architecture that we often associate with cultural institutions, but it also pushes, it pushes back against the idea of the purity of early modernism, that very kind of um, uh, minimal, spare, transparent architecture of the 1920s and 30s. Um, this partly also, sorry, the, the, other, the other idea of brutalism Marco mentioned that it came from England and France. The second idea of brutalism comes from uh, Le Corbusier and his idea of uh, concrete brutes, right? And uh, for, for Corb at that moment in his work, it was a reaction against the screen wall as much as anything else. So if you think of a, of a curtain wall, for example, that hangs on the side of a building versus what we would normally call a wall that goes all the way down to the ground and has foundations, right? So if the curtain wall, if the screen wall was a fundamental enclosure in, in, say, classic modernism through the 1920s and 30s, 40s, um, the, this idea of the, the solid concrete wall that had its roots right in the ground, almost like it was becoming a piece of the ground, became kind of critical. Yeah. So, so the two examples that you see here, one is the um, uh, South Bank uh, Theatre by Dennis Lasden in, in London. Um, and on the right, you see the National Arts Centre by Arkoff in Ottawa, um, both which have this orientation in the case of the South Bank to the river, to the Thames, and in the case of the uh, National Arts Centre to the canal, the Reno Canal. Um, and the, the National Arts Centre very deliberately turns its back on the city to put its front entrance onto the canal. Now this was also part of a larger master plan where the canal was supposed to be expanded um, and that never happened. So it really does feel like the, the, the building is turning its back on the, his, on, on the city. Uh, but one of the things that it, it does by, by so doing is that it distances itself from the vocabulary of the city and really presents itself more as a piece of landscape than as a building in any kind of conventional sense. So by turning its back onto the city and relating itself more to this, even though it's a constructed waterway, there's a kind of reference here to a rock outcropping along a river as opposed to a traditional cultural institution that's part of the fabric of the colonial city in which it, in which it resides. Uh, very carefully orchestrated photography to emphasize this relationship of building to landscape. If, if you know the National Art Center and you know this particular view, what, what this, what this uh, photograph very carefully eliminates is this, is this whole kind of um, driveway access and service to, to this sort of service area and entrance to, at the front of the building, which, which is denied by this photograph, which implies a kind of continuous relationship to the landscape. Now, in the case of the um, um, Fathers of Confederation Center, even though it follows the orthogonal geography of, of the, the surrounding city fabric, it, presents, it also presents itself essentially as a kind of enigmatic series of blocks in the, in the landscape. Uh, there was, until uh, interventions were, were made later, there was no clear entrance to the building. Um, they are a series of, of volumes expressed above grade, interconnected below grade. But when you arrive on this, at this particular site, especially before any of the other interventions were made, it would be extremely difficult to locate a, a front door, right? So again, it's this idea of not creating a clear hierarchy, but creating a kind of continuous landscape with, with a variety of different opportunities for entry so that you don't have a singular privileged facade to this building. And of course, our local example here, the Calgary Planetarium, which, which embodies many of these same ideas, right? It's, it's you know, again, anti-hierarchical, um, it's, it's certainly anti-traditional, and given its program, it's talking about the space race and, and, and our relationship to 
this this you know great technological future, uh, it clearly is is turning away from any kind of historical or traditional representation. Uh, it also isn't clearly part of the fabric of the city. It sits independent of that and relates more to the landscape. Ontario Science Centre is another example where a building actually engages the landscape in a really direct way. It's located on a ravine um, in, in uh, the, sort of the periphery of Toronto, uh, near, in, actually in Don Mills. Um, you enter the building at grade where you basically only experience a one-story building and then as you enter you realize the building actually spills down the ravine and engages the landscape. Um, in the case of the St. John's um, Arts and Culture Centre in Newfoundland, uh, there's a kind of an internalized landscape. So essentially, it's organized very, in a very similar manner to the Fathers of Confederation Center, where there are discrete volumes that house a theater, art gallery, and library. In the case of the Confederation Center, those are actually separate volumes with exterior space around them. In the case of the, of the uh, Newfoundland building, that, that landscape is internalized. So it's essentially a, what we might call an atrium space, but it's, it's, this, it's treated in a very similar manner to this idea of having discrete volumes in a kind of landscape condition. The third theme that we identified was this notion of national identity and regional difference. So one of the things that occurred to us that you know, became quite clear in looking at the buildings that even though they were part of this project, as Diefenbaker said, to establish a kind of national identity and national unity, we could see even through these projects the representation of regional uh, values, ideals, um, uh, modes of expression, and so forth. So even, even in this project that is about creating unity, we can read this sort of subtext of difference in the various projects. Uh, this is a sketch from the project for Vancouver, the museum um, and planetarium. And what struck us about this project was, the, first of all, it was not a brutalist project in the same way as many of the projects across the country were. There was a, a significant interest in transparency, especially at the ground plane. Um, and it also adopted this kind of playful motif of the, of the arcade. But we also see that in the, excuse me, the, the building in Victoria, which is over on, on that wall that Colin showed earlier. Uh, much more transparency and an almost, um, almost orientalist feel to this sort of arcade, which also recalls uh, projects up on the west coast like Arthur Erickson's Filberg House of the late 1950s. So there's a very different kind of sensibility from the brutalist buildings that we're seeing elsewhere. One of the ideas around the brutalist buildings that occurred to us as well was that there's a connection there to um, Northrop Frye's ideas of uh, the garrison mentality. Northrop Frye in 1965 published his um, uh, conclusion to the literary history of Canada. And in that, of course, he's writing about literature, but he's talking about a cultural identity as expressed through literature. And he identifies a relationship to landscape as an essential component of the Canadian identity. So he's writing this at the same time as these projects are being developed. Um, the garrison mentality, he tells us, is a response to the dangers posed by the landscape and the wilderness. So we cluster together, we find strength and safety in numbers, we, we create garrisons that create a kind of protective fortress against the dangers of big nature. The flip side of that, according to Fry, is the uh, pastoral myth, where we are in harmony with nature. And he argues that, that the Canadian identity kind of oscillates between those two extremes, of being with nature and being threatened by it. Um, and certainly in some of the brutalist uh, uh, examples that we see, we do see this fortress-like response, but we also see buildings that adapt themselves to natural form. In the case of the projects like the ones in BC, we see much more of this kind of transparency, which also suggests that we don't need to garrison ourselves against big nature out on the West Coast because it is so much more benign, and so there's this different kind of tradition that emerges there. But certainly, we can see that as, a, so, so climate as a kind of moderator of, of, of regional identity. Um, again, here we are in Calgary with the, um, uh, the planetarium, and this is an image that we found very interesting because it is so abstract in terms of a representation of the building, but we really read it as a representation of landscape. So what, what is this image other than the regional relationship between the prairie, inter you know, sort of transitioning into the Rocky Mountains? Um, I, it's, it's almost too literal um, in that sense, but it very much has that kind of flavor about it. So here, here we have what is ostensibly a regionalist representation of a, of a regional landscape. Um, and again, the, the photography is so important. 
The way this is framed, there's no other buildings anywhere in sight. This is a this is clearly a kind of landscape representation. And we also think, of, although this is just a quick thought because we haven't put much time into this, we think that that somehow there's a relationship between the expressive form of this building and the kind of tradition of of uh, formal expressionism in prairie architecture generally. In some cases, the regional identity comes very much out of the program of the building. This is the uh, uh, Cape Breton Coal Miners Museum, which was uh, the, their centennial project, obviously intended to um, um, commemorate uh, the uh, sort of the, the local driver of the economy, but also the, the men who, um, who gave their lives in this industry, which is, of course, an extremely dangerous uh, uh, pursuit. So the coal miner. Coal Mining Museum became the most important building for, the, for Cape Breton as an expression of their own particular identity. And then finally, Quebec, um, very interesting case here um, because this operates in terms of a regional identity on a number of levels. It's, it can clearly be described as a, as a brutalist building like many of the others, but the particular expression here really recalls the rampart, the ramparted walls of old Quebec City. So there's a very kind of local reference, even though it is a, a brutalist building that actually manages to have some kind of historical representational quality as well. But the other thing that's very interesting about this project um, is this extraordinary um, concrete mural on the interior of the building, which wraps around it wraps around three of the, the walls within the concourse of the building. Um, created by a Montreal-based architect named Jordi Bonnet, who is an, um, originally from Catalonia. Uh, the, the mural is called Death, Life, and Liberty, and clearly deals with themes related to Quebec's struggle for identity and um, independence. Now, this building was the very last of the centennial buildings to be completed. It wasn't opened until 1971. So not only was that four years after the centennial, but that's the year after the Quebec crisis. So by the time this building opens to commemorate Confederation, we've already had the FLQ crisis, the imposition of the War Measures Act, a very, very serious crisis in, in Canadian identity and, and, um, and governance. Um, and this building wasn't even open until a year after that. So it, it, it goes to show that even as this, this party of commemoration and celebration is going on, there are undercurrents, of course, all through the 1960s with, with um, emergent Quebec separatism. But um, even before we could finish the building program, the, that kind of myth of unity and solidarity was kind of blown apart by the events in Quebec of 1970. Okay, so just as a, we have a, a couple of quick uh, epilogues to this story. And I, I just want to go back and, and remind you of uh, Diefenbaker's initial uh, challenge to commemorate the two great building stocks, sorry, the, the two great national stocks that allowed Confederation to happen. And we were thinking about, well, first of all, it occurred to me at one point recently there are no indigenous peoples mentioned in that. But then we started thinking about the names, just the names of the architects involved uh, in a lot of the important projects. And so here's some of the a smattering of the architects from these buildings. Um, on the top left is Dimitri Dimakopoulos, who uh, moved to Canada from Greece in order to study at McGill. Uh, Raymond Moriyama, from who was uh, born in Vancouver, uh, but obviously uh, not of English or French background. Uh, if, we, if we expand it out to Expo, we have Moshe Safdi in the top center, a uh, very young Eber, Eb, Eb Zeidler. Um, Safdi, who was an Israeli Canadian, Eb Zeidler, who came from uh, Germany yeah, yeah. after the Second World War. On the bottom row, we have Victor Proust, who was the architect of the, the uh, Quebec building that we just saw. And Victor Proust was uh, from Poland and also came after the Second World War. Uh, and then Fred Liebensold, who was the architect of the National Arts Center. Fred Liebensold, also Polish, uh, came after the Second World War. And on the bottom right, we have the architect of the uh, Saskatchewan Centennial Auditorium, uh, Kyoshi Izumi, also also born in Vancouver, actually, but also clearly not of French or English stock. 
So it, it seemed to me that, that even then, you know, even in the very project that we were talking about, the kind of myth of that, that, that Diefenbaker, there's another name for you, <laughs> that Diefenbaker was putting forward of English and French stocks uh, doesn't really hold up to the reality of Canada. And, and that brought me back to these two images. And uh, in particular, I'm sorry for this, but I have to do it. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see, um, again, the publication in the REIC Journal of the 1964 uh, annual meeting. On the top of the page, well, in the center is, is Pearson. On the top of the page are the wives of the architects, some of them. And on the bottom of the page are the architects as their wives. <laughs> and, and it occurred to me that, in a way, this whole idea of a national identity in a country like Canada is kind of like dressing up in drag. It's kind of like saying, you know, let's pretend that this is what we are. And, um, and maybe it's time to move past that and think about our identity in a different way. And then the final epiglog that we have is just this one. So this is uh, Trudeau, obviously, Trudeau the Elder, <laughs> uh, leaving the National Arts Center after the opening night. And um, the, there's an apocryphal story that may or may not be true that uh, not after the original opening night of the Art Center, but, but perhaps after the opening night for, uh, for the, the orchestra. Trudeau went to the concert. After the concert, he left, left the National Art Center, went back to 24 Sussex, and signed the War Measures Act. Thanks. <laughs>